Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first ref after the summer break held by Leonard Hoffman, and he will talk about how to forge threats. Thank you again for uh, presenting today, Leonard, and uh, the stage is yours. My name is Leonard Hoffman. I'm a blacksmith here in Norway right now. And um, yeah, many people would call me a man of many vices um, in all senses of that word. I have had quite a passion for post vices uh, for a long time now, um, especially because it's just a, such a big piece of metal that uh, that is so useful to us blacksmiths. And um, I will talk a little bit about the threads of those vices specifically now. Well, my first vice started out in blacksmithing school, and this is this one. And um, I made this as my final piece of the first year of blacksmithing school. And uh, I forged the whole piece. And then when it came to the screw, I had a big problem because I had no clue about how to make that. I couldn't machine. I couldn't. I wasn't good enough for forging it. I didn't know it was possible at that point. I tried brazing it, but I didn't manage. So I, I asked my teacher and worked together about uh, making a lathe. And it was a really big old Russian lathe, with a really bad chuck, and I was really bad at uh, using that lathe. So I had a lot of problems making the screw, especially the internal screw, like the internal threads. Mostly because uh, those internal threads were quite small, but quite uh, quite steep. So um, I had to use a, a pretty long and pretty hefty um, turning tool inside a turning bar inside the, the nut, and had big problems with cheddar. So I wasn't really happy with that whole process, uh, especially since I really like forging every part of project. And it really bothered me that I couldn't forge the threads, that there was a part of this post vice that was everything else on that vice was forged, but it just couldn't forge the thread and, and the nut. Well, I didn't have the time to experiment much when I went to blacksmithing school. Um, but about a year later, uh, when I had started my apprenticeship, my master decided to leave for a week. He had to go somewhere and he told me to make something fun. He just, yeah, didn't care what, just as long as it was fun. So I decided to go for Vice again, which is this one, a lot smaller. And in my typical fashion, I started forging without thinking. So I had made a whole body and I had pretty much made uh, all the parts except for the screw because I couldn't, I still couldn't use a lathe at that point. Still wasn't good with it. So I started uh, reading on the internet on, on what to do. Uh, where could you find where could you find screws? How could I make a screw? And I read until uh, very late at night one uh, one evening, and I found a post in a German blacksmithing forum called Schmiede das Eisen, a very old post, probably like 12 years old at that point, of some madman who apparently had forged threads. And he wrote about it in like, a few sentences, said he did it, said he made a nut, and it worked. He had some pictures, but those pictures had been deleted at that point. So I, yeah, I couldn't watch the, watch those. Um, yeah, I went to bed and uh, forgot to save that page. I've actually never found that page again. So if anybody of you ever sees it, please send it to me. Um, came to the forge next day and, uh, well, decided that I had to forge the threads. It was apparently possible. So uh, why not try it? I had some experience with uh, swaging work, like normal round swages or uh, figurative swages for railings or uh, making acorns and stuff like that. So I decided to go about it that way, making essentially a round swage with threads on the inside. And um, let's see, I will quickly quickly try to show you how I did that. Well, I have brought my, my forging equipment into this uh, nice little office. I have uh, two blocks of what we will pretend to be steel. Uh, which are, uh, of course, not real steel, clay. And I have brought a thread, which I found in a workshop back then. This is a 25 millimeter uh, trapezoidal thread. And pretty much all I did back then was uh, eat two blocks, put this nice thread in between, kind of like this. And then I used the big power hammer and did this. And that's pretty much my first uh, screw swage that I made. And if I open this up again without destroying it, you will see, I hope, that there is threads on the inside. They leave a pretty nice imprint. If you have a big enough power hammer, if your power hammer is too small, those imprints don't turn out too nice. You need to kind of do it in one heat. Um, but, uh, let this loose. 
I essentially had something like this with threads on both sides. And I made a simple spring swage with this, like a one-sided spring swage with the spring coming out one side and just lined it up by having the screw inside when welding the, the spring so that it all, would all line up, in my theory at least. And well, I had it uh, as a handheld uh, spring swage on the power hammer and tried making uh, screws and it did not work at all. It was awful. So I had to try again and I went for a part two, which I can show you. The next swage I made, made in kind of the same way, looks like this. It also forged in the same way, but uh, I was a little smarter and um, made it a little more, let's say, complicated. I put uh, two springs on it instead of one, so that the dice would not open like uh, as, at an angle towards one side, but they will open straight up and down, so that the, the threads would be punched straight up and down. I also put in uh, guiding rods and uh, bolts on the sides. You can see those two bolts welded on the sides on the springs. Um, those are height limiters. Those are there so that the whole swage wouldn't open too wide. Go to the next page here, you can see that a lot better. It's essentially two halves with the springs on the side and those bolts welded to the lower part of the spring with locking nuts on top. So if I tighten down those locking nuts, this whole swage is not able to open. And I can pretty precisely steer how much the swage can open from between like a millimeter to, well, 20, 30 millimeters. And inside the swage, I also put in uh, machine guide bars so that the swage will always stay centered over itself so that the, the threads would not misalign at any point. And this made a big difference uh, with this swage, which I mounted in the power hammer. Uh, yeah, we can, yeah, uh, it's mounted on top of the power hammer dies. Um, I, could, I could actually make some proper threads. The problem I had before was that uh, when, when hitting on the power hammer, um, the die would open too far and I would jump out of the threads that I'd started making. When you feed in a rod, you start making threads, but you need to keep in that same spiral. If you ever jump out of that spiral, you will crush the thread that you've already made. By having those bars on, or the, those height limiters on the side, I can lock this whole block down so that my threads never can jump out of alignment. I always just keep turning a bar into that tool without ever losing the lock essentially on alignment. Um, this is about the simplest switch you can make, to be honest. On the inside, you can see it's just it's just threads. I just uh, chamfered the corners on the left and right side so they wouldn't be um, chafing or wouldn't be cold shots on the sides. And then I ground the first two or three revolutions of the thread down a little bit towards the, the intake so that the threads are formed gradually. It's kind of hard to explain how you use this. So I think I'm just going to show you a little video of how how this works. It, uh, very, very much is sped up. I had a way too small hammer when I did this the first time. I'm using a, I'm a lot bigger hammer now, so it's a little faster. But if I start this, you can probably see how I'm turning the bar into the tool. So as you can see, you need to continually feed it inside, uh, feed it into the into the swage. And then when you want to come back out, you can't just pull it out because, well, the swage is closed. It's only opening about three millimeters. You need to thread the screw you made out of this uh, essentially split nut. And well, uh, if you do this for one or two or three heats, you will get a threaded ball like this one. This is like just out of the swage. Um, you just need to, while working, you need to make sure you don't have any scale on your bar and you don't have scale accumulating inside your swage. So I just used uh, compressed air to blow it out and I used some graphite paste to lubricate the inside of the swage so it would move more freely. Same here, this is, this is like the finished screw essentially after having a, bit of, a little bit of fat applied. Well, the screw part is actually the, the easy part. Well, yeah, right, and that's one thing. Uh, I did not only make, um, make uh, threads for post vices, I had the little let's say a little fun interaction with a blacksmith I met at a museum here. And he talked about making uh, wood screws, forged wood screws. So I had a little excursion on that and I made this tiny little die, 
which makes uh, M6 or like six millimeter wood screws. Not pierced them, but they actually work. We have tested them and they hold pretty well. So made a little, uh, little torque screw. Well, it's uh, just a side note. Um, let's get to the hard part or the way harder part, in my opinion, which is the internal thread or the nut, the nut of the whole, uh, the whole uh, screw. And well, I would love to show you how to forge that with hot steel, but I don't have that. So again, we'll need to go for the clay part. So here I have a little clay tube, which is the same size as the screw I have. So I can just put the screw straight inside. There's no threads right now. And imagine if this was a hot piece of steel, of course, I would thread it on, or on the first steel, I would just push it on. And then in a V-switch like this, with a hammer on top, I just squish it down, turn it, squish it down, all around, until the whole thing sits tight on this screw. And to get it out, well, you need to get it out because you need to do this for more than one heat. I have a hex nut on the back. And I would just hold this in a post vise, use an impact driver, and screw this shit out, which is not as easy with clay as it is with steel, to be honest. But it is possible. So, well, I get this out, and then I heat this part up again, push it in again. I need to thread it on this time, actually, which again, I use with an impact driver. And I squish it on some more. I do this for about three or four or five heats, depending on how thick this pipe is and how thick this uh, screw is. I've done it with uh, different diameters. And you'd need to use some graphite paste and you need to be very fast because if this block cools down too much, it will shrink onto the screw and it will sit like, yeah, it's impossible to get off again. So you need to be very fast. I used the V block in a power hammer. I had a friend of mine or my master standing next to me with an impact driver. He had the screw ready. I came out with the hot tube. He would screw in the screw and I would go to the power hammer immediately, go back out, pull the screw out again, heat again and repeat. But we can just quickly cut this open, which is very nice with clay, which you can't really do with steel. And we can take a look inside. Well, it's a little bit mushed, but you see there's threads inside now. The threads have left an impression in here. And if you do this for enough heat, you will get a pretty good impression of the screw, actually. And uh, the, the best part is you can get a very long impression of that screw. You can, you can get like 100, 150 millimeters of, of impression, which will give you very, a very solid nut, uh, unlike with a turning bar, which you will not be able to get this large of a screw because of the chatter. So if we go back to my presentation, you can see here, this uh, this whole part is forged as, uh, as a single piece, essentially. Um, this, this back part, the uh, eight-sided backside, is just a solid block. Uh, I started out with 85 millimeter round bar, uh, 1060 steel. Uh, forged down to eight-sided and then necked it down to, I think it's 50 millimeter round bar, which I then uh, drilled out in the lathe to, to accept the screw. And then I just forged it like I just showed in a V-switch. Uh, yeah, there, next one. Uh, here's another version I did uh, for a little bit of uh, smaller uh, post wise. Uh, same thing here, forged the backside uh, square this time, necked it down to round bar, drilled out, and then put in a finished screw with a hex nut on the end to be able to retrieve it. And then, uh, yeah, forged the threads inside. It's, it's kind of hard to take pictures of the threads inside this tube, sadly, but uh, I can assure you they work pretty well. I've tried them pretty hard, um, and I haven't had any problems with them so far. They're not like as precise as machine screws, of course, but they, they do work for this kind of this kind of job. Uh, here's another little video to prove that. So this is all, uh, all of course, forged threads. And you can see I'm, I'm bearing down on it quite hard. I'm a hundred kilo man, so I can put some force on that uh, lever and they hold up fine. They work pretty nicely, pretty smoothly. Um, after forging, they can be a little bit tight. Uh, if they're too tight, I've used valve grinding paste, which is just a, a fine grinding paste, which I uh, put on the threads and then I work a screw in and out to take the high spots and corners. Just a couple times and it clears out very nicely. Just wash it off, put fat inside instead. And yeah, the, the screws work flawlessly after that normally. They, they spin very, very freely. Um, yeah, this is uh, the last post I made for my uh, apprenticeship. Um, it's, a, it's a larger model, it's about 60 kg. And on this one as well, I have forged the threads. It's a 34 millimeter trapezoidal thread with a forged uh, nut, of course. Um, 
one important thing, uh, one important thing in my opinion is that use uh, a higher carbon steel uh, in the nut. Um, I would not go for standard construction steel like ST37. I think that will wear out quite quickly, uh, especially in the nut part. It's easy to remake the screw if that gets worn, then it's to make the nut. So I used uh, 1060 steel for the nut and 1045 steel for the screw in, in my post vices Monday. And that has turned out pretty well. I don't harden those. It's just the higher carbon content will give them more strength, especially more tensile strength. So they, they should they should last quite a long time. Uh, here are like uh, some of the last pictures. Um, if, if you're interested in all of this work, you can of course uh, contact me or ask me later. Um, another thing that uh, that I personally think is, uh, is quite interesting or important with those vice threads um, is that you should, uh, well, uh, according to my master at least, he has a, has a, lot, has a lot of thought about this. And um, he really thinks that you should use uh, bronze threads. I haven't tried that. I would really love to try it at some point. And I think one of my next projects will be to try to forge bronze threads instead to have a bronze on steel interface, which will give less friction. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I think I'm kind of on time. Uh, a very quick rundown. <laughs> I would love to talk more about this, but 50 minutes is not that much time. So that's pretty much it. Thank you, Leonard. This has been an awesome presentation. Okay. So, uh, without further ado, any, any questions by anyone? Nice and clear presentation. Thank you, Leonard. Yeah, thanks. Was machst du auf dein Gesenk drauf? Ist das äh, Rapidfit oder was? Du hast ein Gleitmittel drauf, ne? Ja. Uh, ja. Ganz deutlich. Und hast du keine Probleme mit der Längung, weil du, äh, du nimmst ja, so wie ich es verstanden habe, das Originalmaß, Außenmaß von Welle äh, in dem Durchmesser, wo du auch die, äh, das Gewinde herstellen willst, ja. das Tapetsgewinde. Äh, hm. Du hast doch da eine Längung drin. Würde man denken, aber lustigerweise streckt sich das Material nach hinten. Ähm, das ist, scheint im Gesenk so äh, eingeschlossen zu sein, das ist ja fast ein geschlossenes Gesenk, dass sich das Material äh, außerhalb des Gesenkes streckt. Das scheint kein Problem zu sein. Ich habe da auch viel drüber nachgedacht und mich gewundert, wieso das funktioniert. Äh, scheint aber so zu sein, dass das dadurch, dass das Gesenk sich fast schließt, das ist ja eigentlich ein geschlossenes Gesenk, äh, dass sich das Material außerhalb des Gesenks verlängert. Okay, I, I'm going to translate this very quickly. So, <laughs> yeah. also, first asking, um, uh, <laughs> fortunately, uh, Leonard also speaks German. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can, I can, I can uh, give the same answer in uh, English, no problem. What, what, what a blessing. Well, I, I, I just translated very quickly. So Otto has first been asking if he has any kind of lubricant and uh, like graphite paste. And yes, Leonard uses graphite paste during the forging. And then the second question he was like, uh, he, uh, Otto had was, since he is using the same outer diameter of rot as the finished thread is supposed to have, if it's not a problem because one would expect that the material somehow spreads into the thread, uh, in, into the switch. But uh, Leonard said, no, it doesn't. It seems to spread to the front and to the back, like the side switch are open in the switch, since it's anyway like open. Um, and therefore, it seems to work pretty well. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've um, thought about this quite a lot, to be honest. Um, and I've tried smaller material sizes, uh, thinking that to to accommodate for uh, the elongation essentially. Uh, but with smaller material sizes, I have had the problems that the threads don't fully form. So um, I've actually used the same size as the final product or even larger bar. I've tried uh, forging 25 millimeter threads from 28 millimeter bar and it works for some reason. And I don't know why, um, but I think what's happening is that the the sty closes around the threads that are formed and the material that get put, gets pushed outwards gets, gets pushed all the way in the front here and just pushes the parent stock backwards a little bit. So every time you bite off a piece, it, get, it gets locked inside the threads. So it can't elong elongate in here. It just gets pushed out backwards, essentially. That's what I think happens. Uh, I would love to have like a cut open die and look inside, but it's kind of hard to do, sadly. Yo. Uh, I hope Otto, this answers your question. Okay, uh, excellent presentation. My PC camera is well. You 
welcome. Anyway, stuff happens. I, uh, was this like a raised hand, Benjamin? No, uh, it sure wasn't. I was just uh, trying to type in the chat that that was a great presentation, Lennart, and it was very clear and concise. So thanks. <laughs> Litfoot, it was a little fast, Leonard. Uh, I, you had so little time, so I had to speed it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, somebody that asked was no, That was no Dutch. I can't translate it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, uh, there has come a new question to the chat by Paul Foss. Uh, I forgot the used steel quality. Can you mention it again? Well, um, I used 1060 steel or C60 for the nut. And they used uh, 1045 steel for the screws. Okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, if you want to make the swages, of course, um, I would use a higher, uh, more solid steel. So the swages I made in S7 tool steel. But I've uh, I've made swages in 1060 before. Those work for a while, but those will wear out after a while from the yeah from uh, from the forging. Okay. You, Monica. Um, how you said they wear out um, in in ten forty five in C forty five? How often can you use them? Well, oh, to be honest, just, uh, the 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 swages do they hmm. ever wear out? Well, I mean, I'm not sure they, about those in S seven because I've not made enough screws to really wear those out. But I've made uh, one set for the for the wood screws in ten forty five, and mm -hmm. I think those those were not heat treated very well. To be honest. Um, but those wore out after a couple of hundred screws. Okay, well, a couple of hundred, that's pretty good. Yeah, I think uh, I, I didn't make those. One of the other guys at the shop uh, made about 100 or 200 screws. And, and you can, you, they still work, but you can see that the threads they make now are a little less defined than what they were when they were new. But for this larger diameters, those have held up quite nicely. I just... I, to be honest, I haven't made 100 screws. I haven't had the need for 100 uh, TR25 <laughs> screws. So I've only made like 10 or so. And right. that's not the problem. But the, but the S7 swage is holding up well, even yeah. after 10. Yes. Oh. Yeah, you can you can see there's and there's no wear on it, to be honest. Good. You just need to, I think it's important to keep the swage clean from uh, from scale. That, that I think will wear out the swage sooner or later. If you have a lot of scale accumulating in there, accumulating in there, and you hit the scale into the swages a lot of time because it can't get out, it's locked inside those threads, then you will probably wear out those threads quite quickly. But if you keep it clean all the time, then it should work. And and do you mix your graphite cream with anything, or do you just well, use? It's, it's a, no, it's um, it's a graph. You could use graphite cream. I use I make my own graphite cream. It's just a uh, vegetable fat and and graphite powder. Okay. Yeah. So no, I, I don't mix it with anything. I just use it like this. It's a recipe I got from uh, Michel Wunderlich uh, at Oda. Well, I, I have another question. Um, maybe others, please keep on thinking about questions. But you also mentioned you have been for, you have been forging the wooden screws. And I was wondering yeah. how you manage, like, because to me, the wooden thread, the thread in the wooden screws seems to be quite delicate. And I would wonder if it holds up, like being forged, into the dice as you did with uh, as you showed uh, yeah me. that's a good question no it does not it, it certainly doesn't um if you take a wood screw and uh, hit it between two blocks of steel you will get you will get an impression but you will not get a proper impression of what the wood screw looks like essentially you just get a little mark of where each uh, turn of the screw is inside those two blocks but the screw will get completely destroyed by that and you don't really get a good impression at all so what i did i, I Use the wood screw to get an initial impression, and then I ground a chisel to have the, the same profile as those wood screws, and I chased after those marks inside the dies uh, with a, with a little chisel, like chased after every single mark and deepen it on both sides, and then I used the, the the threads like uh, like the the dies like that. Yeah, that's a that's a very good thing. Yeah, they're just too thin, so they will just they just get mushed essentially. Thank you. Well, your presentation has also been very, very clear, straightforward, and uh, no, <laughs> one has now the feeling one can gather experience oneself. I'll ask you another question, Leonard. So you've made three vices, right? Three post four. vices, four post vices. Yeah. What what other application do you see for forging these threads on things, both external and internal? I mean. There's 
I mean, I'm sure that you feel like you could probably have another four post vices in your job. But, Not enough post but, at this point. <laughs> but at some point, you know, you'll be yeah. done with making post vices. What out? What other projects do you see using this thing that you've developed? Well, that's yeah. Um, well, the thing with the, the post vices is an, is an obvious use of course and and following from post vice of course stuff like c clamps and, and similar clamping mechanisms are of course uh, yeah pretty self uh, pretty straightforward um the wood screws i've used quite we've used quite a lot um for uh, actually for like uh, not candle holders but like um oh what's that called like uh, the candle holders that uh, that hang from the roof uh, a chandelier that's okay. the name um yeah we have had orders for those actually for uh, hooks that uh forged hooks with threads on the end to um yeah to screw into uh, wooden roofs to mm-hmm. hang chandeliers from so we have actually made those and sold those uh with forged threads on the end because we had the option between either forging those or welding uh wood screw to the end and we decided the welding wood screw to the end wasn't really what we were trying to make it's not really our style essentially so we, we forged the screws on that and we tested the screws so that they would hold the weight, which mm-hmm. they very much so did. Um, yeah, so that, that's one application. But I think there's there's a lot of applications. The, the thing is that it's pretty much always easier to just buy screws that are ready-made or threads that are ready-made. The whole thing about this is the fun part about having a completely forged element. So essentially, any time you would use a screw, you could forge it. It's just whether it's worth it or whether it's worth it to you in your project. Right. Hmm. What steel type have you used for the wood screws? Oh, uh, that's just my steel. Yeah. I'm pretty sure at least. Like I said, that was mostly done by one of the other guys in the shop. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the ones I made were just my steel. Those are not, they're never going to get screwed in and out and in and out. They're just supposed to hold, like, just stay in and hold there. Right. right. I think, by the way, now that you talk about it, uh, Yuri Hoffi and some other people I have seen use a similar switch for corkscrews. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. And also a similar technique of turning the material into the die. Yeah, I've not seen uh, Yuri Hoffi's uh, one, but uh, if I find it, I would love to take a look at it. Well, now that I have been thinking a bit longer about the wood screws, and uh, if anyone else is up for questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, I I doubt that you would. How how do you go for the tip? Do you well, forge it beforehand or do you forge it afterwards? <laughs> um, well, there is several ways of doing that. Uh, one way I did was when making the dies. If you decide to make wood screws of a certain length, you can make the die the same length. And then when chasing in the, the threads with a chisel, you just don't hit them as deep towards the end of the screw. This will naturally form a, a tip on the screw. But another way to do it is just grind off the tip, but then you need to pre-drill those because they won't, they won't dig in the same as a normal screw would. You need to have like a pilot hole. But yeah, they don't turn out, the tips don't turn out as aggressive or as good as, as bolt screws. If you, if you chase it just right in the die, you might just get it to be to be pretty good, to be honest. Das mit dem Material habe ich nicht ganz verstanden. Was nimmst du für dein Werkzeug? Also fürs Gesenk? Hmm. Und äh, was nimmst du für dein Spindel? Uh, well, the, the, das Gesenk ist S7. S7, Werkzeugstahl, S7. Ja, ja, ja. So S7, S7 Tool Steel for the dice. Um, für die Spindel uh, waren es C45. Hmm. Und für die Mutter C60. Und du schaffst in einem großen äh, Maschinenbaufirma, äh, ne? Nee, das ist eine kleine Schmiede. Also jetzt gerade bin ich in einem Museum. Aber ich in einem Museum und vorher in einer kleinen Schmiede. Wow. Aber mit, mit einem guten Maschinenhammer geht das. <lacht> ja, <lacht> ja. Ja, 100 Kilo Becher. Ja. Uh, maybe some quick translation. So I think the tool steel has also been mentioned beforehand. So we don't have to repeat this. And the second part of the question was if if he's working like if Leonard is working in a bigger workshop and he says no, before he has been working in a uh, medium to small size blacksmith workshop, how I understood with mm-hmm. but with some hundred kilo bichet, power hammer, air hammer, and um 
the other uh, now he's working at the museum yeah yeah sadly no big power hammers here just a tiny tiny spring hammer <laughs> thank you everyone for coming today to the tref Leonard, thank you again for investing the time and making this effort to give this presentation. And uh, I have a couple of more things to say. Brian Davis, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really good. Thank you. Um, the next ref will be, it will be held by Christoph Kühlinger, which maybe some of you know from Schmiede das Eisen or similar for his um, hammers in general or ferrier tooling have been a bit more uh, particular and uh, yeah he will talk about how to uh, of, about ergonomics in the workshop and ergonomic tooling if you are willing to present in one of the future treffs you are very very much invited to do this um, we all do this for uh, sharing the craft we love, the uh, knowledge we have gained, so others have it a bit easier to uh, come along and learn a bit quicker. And if you're interested to give a TREF presentation, it's basically the same. You just either contact me or Paul or Mariano, and uh, you can also use the Blacksmith Without Borders at gmail.com email address. You also find this on the website. Unless you, there has now arisen another question, this would end the official part of today's meeting. <laughs>